What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Just wanted to remind you guys to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you end up enjoying this video. That goes a long way to helping the videos do well and making sure I can continue making daily videos for a long time to come. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in this video, please be sure to leave them in the comments below, as I love reading your guys' thoughts on the stories therein. Without further ado, I'll let you enjoy the next hour of True Scary Stories, and I'll see you guys again at the end of the video. This was back in November of 2018, and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time this happened. My family and I had just moved across states. We'd just gotten to the city where we planned on living after quite a long road trip. We were all extremely hungry, so we decided to go grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us because we hadn't moved into our house quite yet, we decided to eat out in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family though, so I finished well before any of them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business real quick. We were standing just a little ways up from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground together. I grew up in Florida, you see, so I wasn't used to seeing these large piles of autumn leaves. There I was, just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings when all of a sudden I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned back to see a man. My dog noticed him immediately and tried to jump on him as she does with anyone. I pulled her back while I backed away from this random guy. As I observed him closer, he appeared to be in his mid-40s or 50s. He smiled creepily at me, a very forced smile. He said in this scruffy southern voice, You have my dog, my border collie. Immediately, a red flag went off in my mind. My dog very obviously looks nothing like a Border Collie. Now, let me tell you, I'm horrible at confrontation. So instead of confronting him directly, I just nervously said, I think you're mistaken, sir. This is my dog. I didn't even think to tell him how my dog didn't look anything like what he was describing. I looked over quickly to my parents' car that was just a couple of feet ahead of me unsure of what to do in this situation. It seemed they hadn't even noticed the man approaching me, as they were all on their phones. The man then asked me this. Well, if that's not my dog, would you be able to come help me look for it? I could feel my stomach drop in that moment. I didn't want to make a scene. I wasn't sure if I was overreacting or not, but I'd read my fair share of kidnapping and sex trafficking horror stories so I did have a vague idea in the back of my mind about what was going down. He then said something along the lines of, I have some money in my truck for you if you'll help me. My hands were sweating at this point. This was something straight out of a Reddit thread or a movie or something. He pointed over to a very sketchy, run-down looking truck. I told him I was too busy and I had to leave right now. Best of luck finding his dog though. I was still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now though, I don't know why I didn't just tell him my parents were right there. If I did, maybe he would have backed off. I guess I was overly worried about what might happen. I was trying to be polite so we wouldn't get mad and escalate things further. All of a sudden he grabbed my dog's leash out of my hand and said he had treats at his truck. He then started to walk away with my dog. I grabbed the leash back and tried to pull it away from him, sternly saying, I have to go right now. As I tried to walk away, he grabbed my wrist and fully ripped the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He began to pull me along with him, mumbling something like, just come and see what I have for you. My dog, the good sweet girl she was, followed after us and started barking fiercely. He was dragging me pretty firmly along with him. I'm pretty small at 5 foot 4, and I don't have much upper body strength. All I could do was start screaming for him to let go of me. My parents, alarmed after hearing me scream and seeing our dog chasing after me barking, saw the man pulling me against my will. Immediately, they started sprinting after me. I started screaming even louder. 
I think he was alarmed when he heard me yell out to my mom, as he could see her now running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in the car the whole time must have really shocked him. He let me go and tried to make a run for it. We didn't decide to chase after him. My parents were just glad to still have me. This was definitely not a good way to start off our new life in North Carolina. Not even lived there a day yet. I don't wish this sort of thing to ever happen to anyone, as it was extremely terrifying. My advice for you, though, is don't be afraid to use your words, even if they might anger the person. I went to college in a historic mid-sized city in Florida, and at the time lived in a duplex downtown, maybe about three blocks from campus or so. The city is known to be pretty safe, and I lived in a pretty decent area with large historic homes near me. It took place about three years ago. A little backstory that will become relevant. The duplex I lived in had a front door that locked, and then both the upstairs and downstairs units had their own locking door as well. I lived downstairs and had two roommates, but this specific night only one of my roommates was home. We knew the girls that lived upstairs, but really only spoke to them in passing. When they moved in, we emphasized how important it was to us for them to keep the main front door locked at all times. They always made sure to do a really good job of doing so, so, me and my roommate are in for the night, knowing the front door is locked and smoking a few joints. At some point, we hear a knock at the front door and quickly realize the girls upstairs must have ordered a pizza. Later on, we came to find that they'd forgotten to lock the front door again after receiving that pizza. So, we finally go to sleep in our own rooms. Since I had a queen bed, I would often sleep with my phone and laptop right next to me in my bed. A couple of hours after I'd initially fallen asleep, I was suddenly woken up by something I didn't recognize at first. As I came to of it, I came to realize there was a man standing over my bed. As soon as I realized I was not dreaming, I noticed he was quickly moving my phone and computer off of my bed and moving my comforter as well, trying to climb in. I started asking the man who he was, what he's doing here, I was extremely confused and still groggy. I was also still slightly high from before I'd gone to sleep. The only thing he said to me, multiple times, was that he was just trying to get into bed. At this point, I began to panic, as my mind obviously went right to the worst. I was hoping that maybe my roommate had invited some random Tinder guy over and he'd simply gone to the wrong room. But the more I tried to question him, all he had to say was that he was going to get into bed with me. I did own pepper spray and a stun gun, but I had left them on a shelf that the man was right in front of, so there was no way I would be able to grab them without escalating the situation. Realizing I needed to do something quickly, I blurted out, There are five people who live in this house, and if you don't get the fuck out right now, I will scream. They'll be here in seconds. Luckily, that was all it took to scare the man off. I don't know if he brought something with him or if he stole something from me, but I did see him grab at something in the dark and run out of my room. As soon as he left, I shut the door and locked it and tried to find my phone. I couldn't find it anywhere. Then I quickly realized that between my room and the front door was the room of my friend that was still home. As scared as I was in that moment, I was even more terrified that maybe the man had gone into her room. I grabbed my stun gun and my knife, counted to three, and ripped open the door. I burst into my roommate's room, only to find her fast asleep. There was no evidence of the man still being around. I quickly woke her up and told her what happened, and she asked me if I was sure I wasn't dreaming. I even began to question myself, until I walked out of her room and saw our front door wide open. I went to my room to search for my phone, and finally found it, hidden under a pile of clothes across the room from where I'd left it earlier. That sent a chill up my spine, as I immediately knew for a fact someone had been in my house and room while I was sleeping, at least long enough to take and hide my phone. That only worsened my suspicions of his intentions. I ran back to my roommate's room, who at this point believed me. We barricaded ourselves in and called 911. 
Within minutes, there were cars swarming our street and yard, and they yelled for us to quickly leave the residence and run towards them. At least a dozen officers came rushing in and searched every inch of our apartment. We woke up the girls upstairs and searched their apartment as well to ensure the man had well and truly left. The officers had me write a statement, and I gave them a description of the man. To this day, I've never heard a single thing about the case. I just feel incredibly lucky with the outcome of the situation. The thought of his intentions terrifies me though, and additionally, the fact he was never caught scares me. I would hate for anyone to have to go through the pure fear I did. I will add there was a chance he might have been on drugs or mentally ill, and perhaps had no bad intentions. However, because he was never caught, I'll never be able to know. With the fact that he tried to hide my phone, I can only assume the worst. So I'm a bartender at a gentleman's club. Our uniform, if you can call it that, is a very short, skimpy black dress and black bra. Due to my uniform being the way it is, I do my best to not have to go out in public directly after work. This is due to dirty looks and perverted comments that I really don't have the time or patience for. Back before the current state of the world, I had just gotten off work. It was around 2.30 a.m. I believe, and I decided to run to my local Walmart to grab some dog food and other household items. I was thinking there probably wouldn't be anyone there besides staff so late at night. I ran in with a jacket on as well, to try and be at least a little bit modest. I went directly to the pet aisles. I could see there was a guy stalking the shelves. I gave a small wave and smiled, and proceeded to looking for my dog's brand of food. I grabbed a 20 pound bag, and the man asked if I needed some help. I'm not really a small girl, but I do have a slight frame. I'm tall, but very skinny if that makes sense. I told him I was fine, thanked him, and headed to the grocery section. I was in the freezer area when my stalker slash stalker showed up again, this time with another guy. They were just standing there, watching me decide which pizza to pick. When I turned to leave, the man once again asked if I needed any help. I told him no, thanked again, and smiled. I then made my way to the checkout aisle. On my way out, I saw a man heading out about 10 feet behind me. I quickly walked to my car, threw my purchases in the passenger side, jumped in and locked my doors immediately. I was worried this person would try to follow me. All I wanted to do was go home. I felt dumb after realizing the man was going to his own car and it was situated nowhere near me. Breathing a sigh of relief, I started my 15 minute drive home. I was about halfway there when I noticed that black car behind me, taking all the same turns as I was. I live in a very rural area. It's possible he lived nearby, but there weren't many people who ever took these roads, especially not this late at night. I turned a road after mine, and he made the exact same turn. This led to a dead-end road, with only a cow farm at the very end, so I knew now he was definitely following me. I called my boyfriend and told him what was going on. I didn't want to drive home where he would know where I lived and asked my boyfriend to meet me at Walmart instead. I sped the whole way there, hoping a cop was sitting somewhere and would pull me over. The black car was right on my ass. I pulled into the Walmart parking lot and parked directly under a street lamp. The black car pulled into the spot directly across from mine. Now I was freaking out. 15 seconds later, I saw my boyfriend's truck rushing into the lot. He pulled up right next to me, asked if I was okay, and I pointed out the car to him. My boyfriend was not a small man. He was about 6 foot 4, and very muscular as well. His arms alone were about the size of my head. He was a very intimidating person if you don't know him, but really he's a very quiet and kind man. He hopped out of his truck and started to walk over to that car, yelling at them. You need to talk to her about something, or you need to talk to me. The guy in the black car immediately rushed off. I don't know if it was the same man who was hanging out with the stalker or what, but that's why I don't go out after work anymore.
I was in college at the time this happened. My roommate was a born-again Christian, and she invited me to her Bible study and church all the time. Eventually, I did go with her, and kept going as well. I wasn't a big fan of the pastor, but there were a lot of nice young adults who liked to have clean, sober fun. I didn't drink or party at all, so I felt like I fit right in. I didn't necessarily agree with everything they believed in, though. Just the more normal stuff, like God, helping the poor, not some of the more extreme things. This one guy in the Bible study, Drew, was pretty quiet. He was good looking as well. He seemed like he knew everything about the Bible, which really amazed me. At the time, I thought, wow, he knows so much more than me. He's so wise. I was only 21 and he was 27. He wasn't a college student or anything, he just worked, which I later learned maybe he didn't even do that. We were going to go on a young adult's retreat, and because I worked, I couldn't leave early on Friday to drive up to the mountains with the girls in the group. Mutual friends said I could ride with Drew instead, so I said okay. On the way up, Drew was pretty quiet for the first hour, not very friendly at all, and it was a long trip as well. As we started to get closer to the location, he began to warm up a bit, though. We grabbed some pizza, and he paid, which was nice. Then he stopped the car just so we could look at the stars. He even played some Brian McKnight. He was quickly turning it into a date, but I didn't know or see it that way back then. I was starting to like him, and feel like we had a connection, though. He was just about to drop me off at the girl's cabin, when he suddenly got very serious and told me that something had happened between him and another girl in our church group. He told me she was simply telling lies about him and not to believe whatever I heard. He didn't explain what actually happened, mind you, and didn't say who this was either. I entered the cabin and all the girls were there. Very quickly, one girl, Bree, who was the youngest in the entire group at 19, told all of us this. Ladies, there is a wolf in sheep's clothing among us at this retreat. Now, if you don't know church folk, they get very dramatic and tend to talk like this all the time. So, in my mind, I just thought, okay, here's some juicy drama coming up. She told us this story about how she was talking to some guy here, but he started stalking her and wouldn't take no for an answer, even threatened to hurt her sister. Now, my spidey senses were tingling. I realized that this must be what Drew was telling me about. The church group didn't know who it was because she refused to say. She said she didn't want to stir gossip and the leadership would handle it on their own. Drew eventually left the weekend retreat early. There goes my ride back, I thought. I didn't know if he was asked to leave or what. Later that week, though, Drew asked me to hang out, and I agreed. I still liked him and I didn't know who to believe at this point. On our hangout, we didn't really do anything. He took me to the mall and read the Bible to me. Okay, that was a little bit weird. He then parked his car on some suburban lookout and just said he was a view guy who really liked views. I was not one to be impressed by suburban lights. Overall, it was just very boring. I decided to give him another chance, though. I invited him to come see a play with me. When he came, he immediately met one of my good friends, Brian. Brian introduced us to his boyfriend, Nick. I'm in theater, so I have many gay friends. For the majority of the rest of the date, though, Drew lectured me about how all gays are going to hell, and I must not really love them if I didn't stop to tell them that. I began to cry because of this ugly argument in his car. He argued with me for hours in the lot. I just wanted to go home. It turned into the worst date ever. Obviously, I didn't agree with what he said. He then told me I needed to give up on my dream of being an actress, because what if the Lord didn't want me to do that? Theater is something I'd been doing my whole life, not to mention my major as well. His reasons for me giving it up had nothing to do with the impracticality of it, but simply because God said so. I began to see that this guy was nuts. I got home, and I offered to make us some cocoa to just kind of end things as friends, or at least on a better note. I knew I would see him at church in the future, and we had mutual friends as well. Things were going to get weird if it ended badly. He tried to get sexual with me, and then blamed me for tempting him. I ended up crying even more. I just wanted him to go home, but I was so emotionally exhausted I didn't really know what to do. 
He eventually left, called me and texted me that week, but I refused to respond. Sunday night rolled around once more. I was talking to my friend Tim, who no longer went to that church anymore. I told him I'd gone on a date with Drew, and before I could even tell him how it went, Tim said, What? That guy is crazy. You need to abort that mission right now. Turns out he was close with Bree and her family. Drew really was a stalker, and it really threatened to hurt Bree's sister. I didn't know what to do. I hung up and called my mom and tried to tell her what happened, what Tim told me about Drew, how it was such weird timing considering what happened to me. While I was on the phone with my mom, I got a sudden knock at the door. It was 11 p.m. on a Sunday night. I looked out to see who it was, only to find no one was out there. I went to get my roommate and ask her if she could sit with me in the front room. I was freaked out now. There was another knock at the door. I peeked and it was Drew, looking all in a frenzy. I asked him what he was doing there. He said he needed to talk to me. I wasn't answering my phone, so this was the only way. The conversation was getting a bit long in the tooth. My roommate was sitting there in anticipation. I told her she could go back to her room and that it was okay. I let him come in like a dumbass because I'd been conditioned to be overly nice. This was a big mistake. We started talking, but as soon as my roommate left, he pulled out a knife. He started saying how he was worried my neighbors had done something to me because I wasn't answering his texts. That he didn't know what kind of situation he'd be walking into. I have zero fighting skills and no experience in this situation at all. All I could do was to ask him as calmly as possible, Hey, can you put the knife away maybe? He asked me if I wanted the knife. I said no. I somehow talked him down and got him to leave. The next morning, my mind was a lot clearer. I felt like I needed to tell my mom what happened. She had me tell my dad as well, who had me tell the church youth leader and security at my apartment. I told the cop the whole story too, said the guy was definitely a stalker, and I would see him again unless the police visited him. I said it was fine. I thought everything would be okay. I just didn't want any more drama. I had never talked to a cop about anything before. I didn't understand how serious it was, I think. My mistake. The next night, I went to a party. Another church-related one. Drew was not supposed to be there. He'd even told me beforehand he wasn't going. Well, there he was. I decided to leave in that moment but my 21-year-old self didn't think to ask someone to walk me out. I figured if I left and he was still there, problem solved. I didn't anticipate him following me. I was walking to my car in the dark apartment parking lot when I heard him call out my name. He was following me. I started to run, and he began to chase me. I was clicking my car to open, thinking to myself, this is how the white girl dies in the horror movies because she didn't let the cop visit the stalker because she's dumb. Thankfully, though, my car unlocked. I hopped in and drove away. Problem is, Drew already knew where I lived. I had to move out two weeks later and blocked him on all social media. Eventually, he managed to make another Facebook profile and sent me a message that summer, saying he was praying for me and had forgiven me for trashing him to people, even though I never told anyone what happened. That was the last I saw and heard of him. Unfortunately, this predator continued to serve at that church in the junior high ministry of all places, around many young girls. No one on the church leadership listened to me, or to Bree. I never reached out to her to let her know what happened to me, and I never got to hear her full story in detail. I did tell the young adult pastor about the knife and him trying to get sexual with me, and how I was scared. Thankfully, I don't go to that church anymore. This was all pre-Me Too movement. What sucks the most is, I've had quite a few experiences with crazy religious dudes just like him. This was the first, but definitely not the last. I'm still trying to come to terms with why exactly that is. This is a short story that happened to me several years ago, but still affects me to this day. Now, objectively speaking, this may not be the most scary story you've ever heard, but the image is surely burned into my mind and is something I don't think I'll ever forget. School had just ended three weeks prior. 
and my friend and I were hanging out enjoying a surprisingly beautiful summer night. I live in a very quiet little town. There never really is much commotion, or really much of anything going on at all. We have one main school, and our graduating class is tiny compared to most others. Around midnight, we'd gotten pretty sick of playing games, and wanted to try something different. He suggested walking around outside to enjoy the beautiful clear summer night. Without much hesitation, I agreed. It was after midnight in a quiet town, so I figured not much could possibly go wrong. My parents were already asleep, but they trusted me anyway, so sneaking out just to walk probably wouldn't have been a huge issue. We ended up staying out for a couple of hours. We talked about movies, wrestling, what our plans for the rest of the summer would be. Up to this point, it had actually been one of my favorite nights in a long, long time. Just enjoying the nice breeze, the moonlight, and having a wonderful conversation with my good friend. We were already on our way back home, and probably only about five minutes away from my house. We were walking down an extremely dark street. On the right side were some old houses, where 95% of the lights were off and to our left was only trees with no streetlights at all. My friend pointed out as we were walking that some of the sparse light that was visible was hitting the trees and looked almost like a person. We laughed at first and were kind of amazed at how much it really did look like a person was there. After a moment more of observation though, the laughter swiftly faded away as we realized that this was not just a shadow. Like the fools that we were, we decided to explore. I pulled back a few branches and saw that there was actually a woman standing there. She had this huge, disturbing smile on her face. She was old, probably in her 70s I would guess. The weirdest thing is, she was dressed completely normal and had lots of nice jewelry on as well. She looked exactly like how my grandma would dress for holiday parties. She was just standing there, in the brush, still as a statue, and smiling at us. For a moment, we were just stood there in shock and surprise. In a split second, her smile vanished and she jumped out, screaming at us and beginning to chase us. We started to run as fast as we could back to the house. When I turned to look back, to my knowledge, she didn't continue to follow us any further. She just stood there with that disturbing smile. I know most people might not find that particularly scary, but in the middle of the night when you find a creepy old lady hiding in the trees and watching you, it really rattles your cage. Nothing else of note came from this incident, but as I mentioned previously, I'll never be able to get the image of her smiling and suddenly screaming and chasing us out of my head. I remember being a teenager and really enjoying those first few weeks of summer break. Sleeping in, staying up late, hanging out with friends, basically just enjoying being out of school and not having to worry about homework or teachers or responsibilities. On this specific night, my parents were out of town for their anniversary. My friend James was coming over for the night and my brother, who was 20 at the time, was supposed to be there to look after us. It was only for one night after all. Around 1am, James just happened to look out the window and see there were two people standing outside in the middle of the road. They appeared to be looking in through the windows and staring at us. We told my brother, who then decided to go take a look outside. The people had started taking pictures, and it looked like they were snapping photos of us and the inside of our house. My brother really didn't take any of this kind of crap. He went outside and started to yell at the two from our front steps. When he got a bit closer, he could see it was a man and a woman, probably in their 20s, he would guess. The man didn't say anything, but the woman called out. Oh, we're sorry. We're just trying to take a picture of the moon. It really is beautiful. My brother said he didn't care, and they needed to leave right now. She insisted that he come down there with them and look at the moonlight. Then he would understand. After a brief verbal scuffle, my brother then said, if you guys don't get out of my property right now, I'm going to make you. He started to approach the couple. Once my brother went further into the street though, the man who was standing in the road rushed up and smacked him right in the head. James and I sat there in disbelief, 
We didn't know what to do. Clearly, we were only young teenagers, and this guy was attempting to attack my brother. James called the police and explained what was happening. I was having a panic attack, worrying what to do. I looked again, and the man was now kicking him fiercely. The woman stood there, laughing, and seemed to be enjoying it. I covered my eyes, and that's when I heard her suddenly yell, RUN! My neighbor from across the street ran out with a baseball bat. He didn't connect with the man, but he did try to swing at him. They ran off quickly and were out of sight in a moment. The man helped my brother up and helped him to the door. The cops showed up a few minutes later, and we all gave our statements. Of course, there was nothing that could really be done, because none of us could get a good look at the couple in the darkness. Writing this as an adult, I still get a sick feeling in my stomach every time I see the moon on a warm summer night. So the events of this story happened to me several years ago, during the last vacation my family and I ever took during summer break. Every year, we used to drive a couple hours away from my hometown to a beautiful tourist area near the ocean with lots of great seafood. This year was no different, really. We decided to leave in the middle of the night when my dad got off work. That meant we would arrive by 7 a.m. and have the entire day to spend at the ocean. The first part of the trip was great, actually. I slept for a bit, as did my sister and mom. I live on the northeastern coast of the United States, so for a huge stretch of that trip, it was just trees and mountains. Of what I could see, it was actually very relaxing and soothing to try and sleep to. A little after 3 a.m. though, I was suddenly awoken by my dad, who was loudly shouting some curse words. I asked him what was wrong, and he said in an almost nervous voice, It's okay, honey, go back to sleep. Without asking any other questions, I closed my eyes. Almost immediately, though, my eyes shot open again because my dad was swerving the car erratically. I thought my sister was going to go flying out the window. This is when things started to take a turn for the worse. My mom woke up and yelled at my dad, and that's when we found out what was really happening. My dad told us there had been a jeep of some kind behind us for about an hour. They were riding right on our tail, and every time my dad tried to switch lanes, they would do so as well. This was in the time before cell phones were hugely popular, so we had no way to contact the police. We decided to stop at the next rest area and call the authorities. We saw a sign that said it would be coming in two miles. That seemed like forever away now, though, that we knew that whoever this was was really messing with us. If they had truly been following us for an hour, then this was more than just some joke. They definitely intended to harm us. The two miles came by, and we pulled into the 24-hour rest area. We pulled in right out front, and the jeep still followed us in. I had never been so scared in my entire life. My mom, sister, and I got out of the car to go inside and call the police, while my dad tried to defend himself. I'll never forget what I saw when I stepped out. It was a navy blue jeep, and had five people inside. They all were wearing white masks that had different smiling artwork on them. All five people got out of the car and stood there staring at my dad. One of the figures looked like they were holding a weapon, but I honestly couldn't be sure. I still can't believe the luck of what happened next. A patrol car just happened to pull in in that exact moment, and the masked people rushed back into their jeep and drove off. We flagged the cop down and explained what had happened. We all gave our statement as well. We ended up staying at the rest stop until dawn and continued with the rest of our trip during the day. I wish I could explain the full horror to you of seeing that car full of people with those masks on. Why the hell would they follow us for an entire hour if they were just trying to scare the shit out of us? And what would have happened if that patrol car didn't show up at that exact moment? So I might have a different perspective on summer than most of you. I usually hated the summer. My parents both worked during the day, and that left me to do all the chores every single freaking day. I hated it. My friends were all out doing everything they wanted, while I had to do house and yard work. One particular day, 
I was tasked with painting the spindles on the front porch, which would probably even take more than one full day to do. While I was out there painting, I heard the loudest noise coming from the street. It sounded like someone was rolling a tool chest down the road or something. I looked over and saw an old guy with a cart that had a bunch of what looked like tools on it. After looking further and putting two and two together, it appeared to be a portable cart to sharpen knives. Having some extra cash and thinking I would do something nice for my parents, I flagged the man down. I ran inside and grabbed the knife block to bring out the knives to be sharpened. I told the man I was doing it for my parents. He looked over at me and whispered in my ear, Such a nice boy. He completed the sharpening for me and I gave him the cash. He thanked me and continued down the road, slowly but surely. When my parents got home, I could tell they really appreciated the gesture. I think, though, they were more focused on the painting and how good of a job I'd surprisingly did. That night, I slept in my living room so I could stay up and watch TV without waking my parents up. I had to pause the TV at one point, though, because I began to hear a weird, loud noise. I moved the blinds near the couch and looked outside. I saw that exact same cart from earlier. Uh, what the fuck? I looked around, but all I could see was the cart. The man was nowhere to be found. It seemed my dog could tell something was up, though. As I went to turn the back porch light on and let her out, though, I could have sworn I just saw someone shuffle behind the garage. I freaked out, rushed to my dad, and told him what I thought I'd seen. He looked out front and did see the cart, but when he went behind the garage, he didn't find anything. I went to the side door to make sure it was locked, only to find the old man staring directly against it and staring into our home. I screamed for my dad. He ran and came out and confronted the man. I don't remember exactly what he said, but he was yelling like he never had before, shouting expletives all over the place. He called the cops right away, and the cops eventually showed up. They took statements and took the man who was surprisingly still there away. I think he was charged with trespassing or something along those lines. It's been years since these events have taken place, and the only thing I can still really visualize are those spindles on the front porch and the old man's face pressed against the side door when I went to go look at it. I don't think I'll ever forget that image as much as I'd really like to. Anyway, I hope that story spooked a few of you out there. And if not, I hope it at least was a good one to fall asleep to. Summer break is an awesome time to kick back, relax, and even enjoy some traveling. Unfortunately for me, my summer break did not consist of vacationing or kicking back at all. My old roommate Dave was going on vacation with his fiance, and so he asked me to take care of his golden retriever Millard. Always trying to make a quick buck myself, I quickly accepted. I planned on staying overnight with Millard while Dave would be gone for a couple of nights. Feeling lonely, I asked some of my friends to come over and hang out for a while. We sat outside, made some wings, and just hung out for a couple of hours. I had to work at 6.30 in the morning though, so I kicked them all out at around 11 and decided to go get ready for bed. I put on the TV and made myself comfortable on the living room couch. I started to doze off, and while I was going in and out of sleep, I suddenly heard the doorbell ring. I kind of jolted awake and sat still for a moment. I thought perhaps it was only the TV. Maybe I'd just woken myself up thinking it was the actual doorbell. That was quickly proven false though, when the doorbell began to ring over and over again. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I grabbed my watch and saw it was close to midnight. Who the hell could possibly be at the door at this hour of night? I slowly approached as the bell continued ringing. I could see there was a shady looking man outside with a backwards ball cap on. He had a big brown bag in his hand as well. I opened the front door a crack while still keeping the chain on. I didn't open the screen door either. I quickly asked the man what he wanted. In a very soft, unconvincing tone, he said this. Hi, I have your food delivery here. I immediately yelled that I didn't order any food. He proceeded to say my address and then followed with, that is your address, right? 
I have your delivery right here. More annoyed than anything else, I told him once more he had the wrong house and slammed the door in his face. I then turned all the lights off. The house I was staying in was a split-level ranch. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's kind of like having a one-and-a-half-story house. The basement is usually a living room and not completely underground either. The windows are about eye level. I went to check on the basement part of the house and was looking out the front windows. The man was just sitting in his car, the car not on, and still parked in my driveway. I was a little bit spooked at this point, so I called my brother to tell him what happened. He told me not to worry too much, and it was probably just some kind of mistake. I agreed and went to check back out the window, only to see the car was still there in the driveway, but the man was no longer inside. I grabbed the dog and locked myself in Dave's bedroom. She barked and growled all night long. I'm not sure if it was because she could hear things outside or because she was stuck in the room with me. I hardly slept a wink that night, and when it was time for me to leave for work, I got ready in the bedroom, then ran out of the house as fast as I could. I had a brief moment of relief when I noticed the car was no longer in the driveway. That soon changed, however, when I turned the corner and saw the car was now parked at the side of the road. I went to work terrified. I blasted my friends that day, asking them if this was some kind of practical joke. They assured me, though, that it was not them. I came back to feed Millard after work with one of my friends, and we noticed footprints circling the house and scratches on the siding where one of the back windows was. It looked like someone had tried to scare me, or perhaps actually tried to break in and had simply been unsuccessful. In hindsight, I realized I probably should have gotten the license plate number, but I just thought I was maybe being paranoid. I could have also asked what company they represented so I could call to see if it was a real order or not. When Dave returned, I brought this event up to him, and he said he'd never had an experience like this. Maybe it was simply a fluke. Maybe the delivery person was pissed they got pranked and now stuck with the bill and decided to take revenge. Or perhaps I was in some real danger. Either way, this is one summer night I still bring up to my friends when they want to hear a freaky story. I'll try to tell this story to the best of my ability, but as my friends could tell you, I have a terrible memory. Some details may be weird because of this. This happened to me when I was 14 years old, and I'm now 27. It was summer break. I can remember it because I was extremely bored and felt like I could literally die from boredom at any moment. My parents went to work every morning, and because of this, I was left home alone to do the chores. I was a trustworthy kid, though, so my parents allowed me to do so. The only two rules were to never leave the house and to not use the oven by myself. I lived in a really nice area, other than one extremely old, ugly house on the corner. The house was covered with vines and all sorts of unkempt landscaping everywhere. Well, one summer day, my 14-year-old self thought it was a good idea to go and check out this house. It was during the day, too, so I didn't figure anything could really go wrong. I wanted to see the inside. I wasn't going to steal or anything, I just wanted to see what it looked like. Every day when we used to get off the bus, we would always tell stories about this house being haunted and other spooky stuff like that. Well, when I finally saw my friends again after break, I wanted to tell them about my bravery of going inside the house. I got all black clothes on and thought I was being super sneaky. It was around 12 in the afternoon though, so I probably stood out like a sore thumb and looked like a moron. I approached the front of the house and was surprised to see the door was actually locked. I banged on the door for a second and was able to easily jimmy the lock. I opened the door and my excitement quickly vanished when I was greeted by an elderly man holding a knife toward my face. He looked so old that I almost thought he was a ghost or something. He had a long white beard and Albert Einstein looking hair. He was wearing a thick red flannel despite it being summer. As soon as I had a split second to process this man holding a knife to my face, I turned and ran as fast as I could. I heard him yell out after me, That's it. You're dead. I of course had no idea what he meant by that. My 14-year-old heart was beating out of my chest. I was in amazement that somebody actually lived there. 
I was starting to panic that I was going to get arrested for breaking in. My parents were going to kill me, and I was going to be in so much trouble. Well, sure enough, several minutes later, the police showed up at my house, and my parents were called right away. The cop was really nice, and I explained to them that I thought it was just an abandoned house. What got me in trouble was that that old man said I had been terrorizing him for weeks. In truth, that was the first time I'd ever been there, though. According to the old man, he said he'd been hearing my footsteps downstairs in his kitchen when he was trying to sleep. Luckily, I was only 14 and had my parents to defend me and say that was obviously not true. Fast forward about a week. I was grounded for just about my entire life, but most of the dust had now cleared. That was until my doorbell rang. It was the cops again. I explained that I had been home the entire day, and luckily my dad was off that day and he was there to back up my story. Upon further investigation into the matter, the police found that somebody had been secretly living in the old man's crawlspace for weeks. At night, this person would sneak out, steal the man's food, and use the restroom. The day I broke in, he was suspicious because he'd been hearing a lot of noise the previous night, and when he saw me, he assumed I must be the intruder. The man actually came to talk to my dad and thanked me for breaking in, because it helped him figure out what was really going on. So, yeah, I had a great story to tell my friends. Sad thing was, I was grounded for the remainder of the summer and was going to have to wait for school to tell them. I had a run of bad luck for a while. I was in a very bad relationship, and I really had no way to get out of it. My family was not very supportive of me. They had this rule that once you moved out of the house, you stayed out for good. So, no matter what happened, I couldn't leave and go back with them. Most of my other relatives lived far away, and I had lost contact with most of my friends during the relationship as well. I wasn't really going to be able to stay with anyone. In order to get out of the situation, I had to do something I never thought I'd have to do in my life. I decided to run away and live in my car. Now, while it sounds like it might have been really bad, actually it wasn't really so awful. I had blankets and pillows and I could just lay down in the back seat with no problem. I could listen to talk radio and sports when I was bored and I could also find something to read. I had a roof over my head and protection from the elements, for the most part. The only thing that was really difficult was finding a safe place to park. It wasn't that difficult during the day. I would just park at my place of business and go in for work. I could hang out in the parking lot for a little while, but I couldn't stay there for too long. If my boss found out I was living out of my car, what might he have thought? Also, I couldn't spend too many nights in the same parking lot either. I would likely draw too much attention to myself. I had been staying in the parking lot of an apartment complex for a few nights, when I inadvertently caught notice of a drug deal going on. Although those involved in the deal didn't seem to see me, I didn't feel safe parking there anymore. The following evening, I looked around until I eventually found the parking lot of a small restroom in a park. I wasn't exactly sure I wouldn't be found parking there, but I was too exhausted searching for a new place and thought I could get at least a few hours of sleep before being found. I wasn't sure for how long I actually slept. It's important to know that when I slept in the back seat, I completely covered myself in blankets so I wouldn't be seen. Out of nowhere though, I got woken up by this strange screeching noise. It was so weird. I remember twitching under my blankets listening to it. I didn't completely wake up though. I was used to hearing weird noises after being in my car for so long. Likely it was just another car so I shuffled around under my blankets to get a bit more comfortable and tried to fall back asleep. Just before I could drift back off though, I heard the screeching sound once more. I groaned a little out of annoyance, wondering what this noise was yet still. I didn't think I needed to get out from under my blankets yet though. Parking lot noises were just something you had to force yourself to put up with. I tried to force myself to go back to bed, when suddenly I began to feel a shaking movement. I was still half asleep, so I couldn't quite figure out what that feeling could be at first. 
Then it began to happen more. The second time, I was a lot more certain I knew what that feeling was. Someone was making my car bounce up and down. I quickly and fully woke up. I was too scared now to look out from under my blankets, though. It only took a few more bumps and then another creaking noise before I realized that whoever was doing this must have known I was there in the back seat. Peeking out from underneath my blankets, I saw two things initially. There was a young man standing on the front of my car, jumping on my car to make it bounce up and down. But the thing that scared me the most, the creaking sound was coming from a man who was using the tip of a large knife to scrape against the side of my car. He pressed it up against the siding, then the window. Fortunately, my doors were locked. I also kept my keys with me under the blankets. This was so no one could see my keys in my car and think it was a free steal or something. I quickly snatched them up. I had been living in my car for weeks, so I could easily get into the front seat quickly. I grabbed the keys, and the man with the knife began to pound on the window when he saw I was getting up. The other guy kept making the car bounce more and more. I put my keys in the ignition and started the car. I didn't care about the guy making my car bounce up and down, so I put the car in reverse and slammed the gas, sending him flying to the ground. I didn't care, though. The other guy came after the car, trying to stab at my window while screaming obscenities at me. He was swishing his knife back and forth in the air. Again, I didn't care. I made it perfectly clear I was willing to run him over. He got the picture and got out of my way as I sped off into the night. The side of my car was all scratched up and looked like crap, but I realized how dangerous it was to be doing what I had been doing. I stayed in a hotel room every night after. It was a very cheap hotel, and not the cleanest in the world, but it was much safer than staying in a parking lot. I was walking home from the bus stop, which was two blocks away from my house, when this scummy-looking guy in a car stopped by me. I couldn't hear what he was saying at first, because I was listening to my music, but I could feel that someone was there watching me. I turned my head in his direction. Uh, excuse me, hello? Do you know where Sun Street is, perhaps? I forgot what he said after, but I'd never heard of that street before. I remember feeling bad for this guy at first, so I tried to help him. Uh, no sir, I'm sorry, I've never heard of that place before. Could you tell me a bit more of what you're looking for? I started to get a bit weirded out though, when he told me to come closer to his car. I didn't want to get any closer. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna have to go. The man began to scream at me, telling me to fucking help him or else. I told him I simply had to get home. I could tell he was about to open his car door in a rage, so I ran as fast as I could. When I turned around though, his car was already gone. A bit of a short, scary encounter, I guess. This happened a very, very long time ago. I hope my memory is intact and that I'm telling the story as close to exact as how it happened. Although born and raised in the Midwest, I went to live on the West Coast after I graduated high school. I was one of those people who thought he would hit it big time in Hollywood. There were just as many of us back then as there are nowadays. I was able to get a decent job and a good enough car that I could travel back home at least once a year to visit my family. And trust me, there was no way I was going to get any of them to drive out to California to see me. If you've gone for a long drive, you know exactly what that's like. It can take a long time to get to where you're going, and back then we didn't have internet to check the weather for an entire trip. It was not always easy to know what to expect for the entire ride because of this. I often ran into sudden thunderstorms or snowstorms or other kinds of inclement weather. I was in my early 20s when I was making this particular trip. I had gotten through the bulk of the trip already and was just approaching the final part of it. This night would be the last night I would have to drive and I would arrive at my parents' home the next evening. Well, sometime in the afternoon, I must have hit a really huge storm system. I could see the storm clouds in the sky, 
long before I actually met them, and when I did meet them, they lasted for a very long time. There was thunder, lightning, strong winds, and even large pieces of hail at certain parts of the trip. I feel somewhat fortunate I didn't come across any tornadoes as well. The weather was so extreme, and it stayed that way for a very long time. I decided to stop in a town in order to fill up my gas tank and take a break. While I was there, I noticed this guy hanging around the station. He looked like he might have been a few years younger than I was. He was dressed in a dark green jacket and was carrying a backpack. It was obvious to me right away that he was trying to hitchhike. I had picked up other hitchhikers before, and I'd never had a problem with it. Still, I went into the store and picked up a few items, before finally deciding to offer him a ride. By the time I got out and was ready to go back on the road, I decided I would at least approach him and see where he was going first. Initially, he seemed very nice and pleasant. He told me he was a college student, and he was trying to find his way back to school. He had been staying with some friends during vacation, but they refused to give him a ride back for some reason. So, he'd been hitching rides throughout the past few days, trying to make his way back to campus. It turned out his college campus was right along the way. It was going to be a very short ride there, actually. He was practically almost home, and probably could have walked the distance if he really wanted to. I agreed to give him a ride because of this. I didn't like the idea of leaving anyone to be out on the road walking during this sort of weather. Plus, I wasn't worried about picking up a hitchhiker either. I had hitched several times when I was younger, and for some reason it never occurred to me that the hitchhiker could be the dangerous person. I always wrongly assumed it had to be the person driving the car. For the first part of the ride, everything seemed pretty normal. We made the usual small talk that anyone tended to make in such a situation. I asked him about various things such as school, and he seemed to answer them honestly. He also asked me what I was doing driving in this weather and I told him that I was visiting my family. It was mostly a pleasant time. As we got closer and closer to the town that his campus was by, however, his mood began to rapidly change. Where he was at first in a decent and very talkative mood, he slowly went quiet and seemed to get very agitated. I wanted to ask him what was wrong, but for some reason I felt it would be wrong to do so. I didn't ask him but kept talking to myself. I also kept an eye on him to see if anything was wrong. I really started to get nervous and began to wonder if I had made a mistake in picking this guy up. He didn't seem angry though and didn't seem annoyed that I kept talking when he slowly went quiet. It actually seemed more like he was very scared of something. When I first suspected it might be fear, I wanted to try and figure out what could be scaring him. But again, I didn't know how to bring that up to him. I just kept it to myself and was only talking about things I didn't think would upset him. When we got into town, it was still storming very hard outside. I asked him if he wanted me to take him onto campus and to his dormitory. He shook his head though, and sort of muttered that he didn't live in a dorm. He said he would give me off-campus directions to his house, and told me to make a few turns after. Other than giving me directions though, he refused to say anything else. In fact, he seemed to be getting more agitated, he told me to turn onto the street where the house he stayed at was. I pulled up in front, and he asked me to honk the horn once to let his roommates know he was home. He didn't have a key to the house, he explained. Although I found this request odd, I still did so. The front porch light went on. Then I saw the door shoot open, and a few men rushed out the front door. They began to approach the car. Out of nowhere, the guy told me to drive off right now. I looked at him strangely and his agitation had gone to a full-blown panic. He began hitting his leg with his fist and urging me to go right now as quickly as possible. I didn't know what was going on, but he seemed to be absolutely terrified. I put the car in gear and shot off down the street. Looking into the rearview mirror as I drove away, I noticed that the guys were now sprinting down the street towards us. One of them was yelling and screaming something, but of course, there was no way they could keep up with us. My passenger told me to turn, and told me to take several different turns very quickly. I did exactly what he told me to, but kept asking him what was going on. He didn't say anything at first, but kept telling me to go in certain specific directions. When we finally pulled into a parking lot, 
He told me to cut the car off. I was confused by what was going on, but the way he was acting was concerning enough for me to do what he said. He explained to me that the whole thing was a setup. He was supposed to hitch a ride, take the driver to that house, and then the people at the house were all going to attack me. That's why he'd had me honk the horn. He said that he wasn't comfortable with the idea though, and changed his mind at the last minute since I was so nice. That's why he kept getting so agitated in the car earlier. He apologized, but before I could even respond, he opened the door and ran off into the storm. Honestly, I was stunned by what had happened. I hadn't realized how close I'd come to getting attacked, and who knows what else by this hitchhiker and his friends. I was appreciative that he'd changed his mind, sure but I was really worried about what would happen to him when he met up with those guys again. I mean, surely they would punish him for backing out. I drove around a little to see if I could find him, but he disappeared into the storm way too quickly. I gave up after a bit and resumed my trip home. The rest of the trip went very smoothly, and I had a good time with my family after. I always remember being somewhat scared of the dark when I was a younger kid. This was before I had a real scary experience even. I would do what a lot of kids did when I was growing up. I would see shadows and other things in the dark, and I would involuntarily start imagining what those shapes and patterns could be. Then, due to my likely overactive imagination, I'd put scary stories to those shapes and patterns. In the beginning, doing these things had the effect on me that it would have on any young kid, really. It filled my head with ideas that would terrify the hell out of me. My parents were not the type to let the kids come into their room when they were scared. They expected us to be able to try and get over it on our own. They felt that doing so would make us stronger adults, and I guess I can kind of see their point. When we were younger, though, that was hardly any solace. When you're scared of something that you might believe to be in your room, facing it doesn't really help much. What I did was try to make a nicer story out of the shapes and shadows that I'd see everywhere. Although this was hard at first, it eventually became a lot easier. Whenever I felt even a little bit scared, I tried to create a friendlier story in my head. After a while, I would eventually just fall asleep without even realizing it. I'll admit that even now, well into my older age, I still get scared of the dark sometimes. At the age this story took place, however, I was much more scared of thunderstorms than I was of the dark. There was a night when I was 12 years old that I had a scary experience that was both in the dark and during a thunderstorm. It was on a Friday night, which I remember because I was the only kid who was home that night because of it. My other siblings had all gone off for weekend sleepovers, which they were only allowed to do on Friday nights. I knew it was going to be quite the storm, because the clouds on the way home from school were looking pretty damn dark and scary. I also knew it was going to be quite the doozy of a storm as well. By the time that I had dinner with my parents, the storm had hit quite fiercely. It was going to be unfortunate though, because at the time, my parents were doing a part-time job every Friday and Sunday night. There were housing subdivisions opening up in the area and doing house showings, so every Friday, my parents would go out at night and put up signs that would guide people to the subdivisions all over the county. They normally left right after we would have had dinner and would not get back until well after midnight. I was concerned for them being out in the storm, of course, but I was also quite concerned of having to be by myself the whole time. I knew that with my siblings at their friends' houses and my parents out working, I would have to weather the storm all by myself. I stayed up for a while watching TV. If I hadn't been so tired, I likely would have tried and waited for my parents to get home before trying to sleep. Watching television, though, I found myself drifting off a few times. I realized I was probably not going to be able to make it, and tried to simply go to sleep. I originally fell asleep pretty easily, but I woke up when a loud crack of thunder shook my house. I opened up my eyes and jumped up in my bed just a little. It took me a moment to get my wits about me. It was unusually dark, much darker than it normally would have been otherwise. A quick look over my alarm clock showed that the power must be out. From the looks of how dark it was outside, 
I was guessing it must be out for the entire neighborhood. I kept looking outside, watching the moving branches of a tree that was not far from my window. I suspected the wind must be blowing really hard because of how quickly the shadows of the branches were moving. Not too long after I began staring at that tree, there was a tremendously bright flash of lightning. It lit up the entire outside, as well as my bedroom. Although, like lightning is known to do, it only lasted a split second. In the moment, it seemed to last a lot longer. This was because what I thought were the shadows of tree branches in the dark slapping against my window were something else entirely. In that instant, I noticed a person standing outside my bedroom window. He was doing something, but the brightness of the flash lit up my room as well. In that moment, we both looked at each other, the man clearly shocked to see me. I think for the first and only time in my entire life, I actually screamed. I don't know what was going through my head for sure, but I immediately thought someone was trying to break into my home. I figured with the lights all out and my parents' car gone, perhaps he thought no one was there. I jumped out of bed and ran to the living room. Fortunately, even though the power was out, the landline phone still worked. I immediately called 911 and told them someone was breaking into my home. I then ran into my parents' room and hid in their closet, waiting for the police to arrive. My dad had a big knife in the closet he used to hunt, which I clung onto. It took a little bit for the police to arrive. I jumped at every sound and was terrified at every strike of lightning. Eventually, the police arrived, and I finally felt safe. Looking around, it looked like the guy didn't try to break into the home after all. He was definitely trying to get in through my window, though. I guess seeing me and hearing me scream must have scared him off. He may have assumed that if a child my age was home, others might have been too. They looked around for him, I guess, but to my knowledge, they never discovered him. They doubted he would ever come back, but that was of little comfort to me. I continuously worried about him coming back to finish what he started. It took me years before I was completely able to not be scared anymore. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in the comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys. So thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.